help you learn about the brain, I'm going to recount the story of Frankenstein with each scene in the story associated with a different area in the brain. Now, it just so happens that in the story of Frankenstein, the order in which the monster gains different abilities matches the order of functions in the brain, going from the bottom hindbrain up through the midbrain, through the subcortical forebrain, all the way to the top of the cerebral cortex. And so, if you follow along with the details of the story and picture each scene as vividly as possible, afterwards, when you recall the story, the names and functions of each brain structure should automatically come to mind without any effort at all. Our story begins with young Victor Frankenstein, a college student who pondered how the brain produces consciousness, and one day he came up with an insight. To test his theory of consciousness, Victor snuck into the college hospital late at night in the basement and stole dead bodies from its morgue. After transplanting body parts from the recently deceased, Victor was able to bring back to life the heart rate and breathing of a creature. In order to have these vital medical functions, the medulla in the brainstem must be functioning. So I've given this area of the brain the nickname, the medical medulla. If this area of the brainstem is functioning, but nothing above it is, this results in coma in patients. Victor next took the body to his lab. By turning on power, Victor was able to give basic levels of consciousness to his creature in terms of having periods with eyes open and body movements, cycling with periods with stillness and eyes closed. This indicates that the area in the brainstem known as the pons must be functioning in the creature. And I've given this area the nickname the power on pons. If the pons is functioning in a patient, but nothing above in the brain is working, then this results in a vegetative state. What happened when Victor brought his creature to consciousness? Was he rejoiced? No, in fact, he got scared and ran away. <laughs> Victor didn't get the courage to visit the campus again until the following morning. When he did, he encountered the monster. Instead of stumbling about like zombies do in movies, instead the Frankenstein monster glided smoothly about. This indicates that its cerebellum at the back of the brainstem must be functioning, and I've given this area the nickname the Sway Like a Bell Cerebellum. If this area is damaged and results in something called cerebellar ataxia, it's often mistaken for drunken walking. Returning to our story, after seeing the monster again, Victor Frankenstein now fainted. He spent the next several months in an insane asylum to finally manage to convince himself that the image of the monster they'd seen before was just a hallucination. However, when he got back home, slowly one by one his friends and family members wound up dead. So Victor decided to investigate what was causing these murders, and he concluded that the monster must be real and must be causing these murders. However, what was still an unsolved mystery was why his monster had become a sociopath. Eventually, Victor learned the story of what happened to the monster after he last saw him and how he turned into a sociopath. After Victor fainted, the monster now wandered about on campus, but instead of going in and out of sleep as before, now he is able to maintain his vigilance for long periods of time. This indicates that the retic formation, which runs up through the center of the brainstem and stimulates the forebrain, must be functioning in the monster in order to do this. I have given this area the nickname the Rousen Retic Formation. If this area is damaged in patients, they can results are coma or vegetative state, depending on whether the pons is also functioning or not. The monster next wandered about through the parking lot of the campus, 
but even though everything was completely black to him and he was blind, he was still able to navigate around and avoid tripping over objects like fences. This indicates that the area of the midbrain known as the superior colliculus must be functioning in the monster. And I've given this area of the brain the nickname the seeing eye collie superior colliculus. If patients have damaged the back of their cortex, the visual cortex, but still have intact their superior colliculus, then they act like they have an invisible seeing eye collie dog that can guide them around objects even though they claim to not be able to see them at all. The monster next wandered through the forest outside of campus until at nighttime it came across a light and approached it. The monster came across an abandoned campfire and having never seen a fire before, reached out and put his hand into it. Oh! The pain that the monster experienced indicates that its periaqueductal gray area in the midbrain must be functioning. I have given this area the nickname the painful periaqueductal gray. The next day while wandering through the forest, the monster came across some food litter on the ground, including a Starbucks venti coffee. The cravings that he experienced for having more coffee, as well as the increased locomotor activity they showed, indicates that the two dopaminergic areas in his midbrain are working. Those are the ventral tegmental area and the substantia nigra, which respectively control cravings and reward systems and uh, general voluntary activity as well. And almost all the doping from the entire brain are supplied by these two areas in the midbrain. I've given them the nicknames for Vendigon mental, ventral tegmental area, and the stop standing where you are, substantia nigra. After coming out of the forest, the monster next experienced a multiplicity of senses, and all the senses were confused together, but slowly over time he began to be able to separate out his vision and his hearing and his other senses. This indicates that the thalamus of the creature must be functioning, since the thalamus acts as a filter and sensory relay station for incoming sensory signals, sending them off to the appropriate areas higher up in the cortex. And I've given this area of the brain the nickname Follow Thus Thalamus. It's a lot like a traffic control person directing traffic to the appropriate locations at a fork in the road. After being in the forest for so long, the monster started to feel rather cold. <laughs> so he walked into a sunny patch in a large open field. But then after being in the sun for too long, he started to overheat and sweat and get tired, as well as hungry. This indicates that the hypothalamus area of the monster's brain must be functioning, and I've given this area the nickname the hypothermic hypothalamus. The monster next came across a large house, and being hungry, he decided to enter into it, see if there was any food to be eaten there. Inside the house was a young boy playing. Deedly, deedly, deedly. Huh? After having objects thrown at him from the protective mother, the monster became very frightened and ran away. This indicates that the amygdala inside the monster's forebrain must be working. I've given this area the nickname the anxious amygdala. The monster next came across a school and was about to enter into it, but remembering what happened the last time he went into a building, he decided not to instead. This indicates that the hippocampus inside the monster's forebrain must be functioning, since the hippocampus is necessary in order to consciously remember past events. I have given this area the nickname Hippo on Campus, Hippocampus. It's just like how an elephant never forgets the hippo campus inside your brain helps you remember events like a hippo studying material, memorizing material on campus. While walking through the field beside the school, a baseball came near the monster, and he reflexively reached out and grabbed it. However, when he saw the rowdy baseball players that had hit the ball, he froze and became unable to move like a statue. Luckily, this lasted only a short period of time, and he was able to muster the willpower to be able to move again and get out of there. This indicates that the basal ganglia structure inside the monster's forebrain must be functioning since this area is necessary in order to allow you to do voluntary movements. I've given this area the nickname the Baseball Ganglita Basal Ganglia 
since um, it's a bit like a gang leader in that it uh, takes information from the different areas of the brain but decides which actions to allow to happen, which ones to hold off on. To get away from everyone, the monster next decided to climb up into the peaks of nearby mountains, high above everybody else. This is similar to the cerebral cortex, which is a thin layer of neurons that sits on the very top of the brain, and I've given it the nickname Apex Cortex, because just like how mountains have their peaks and their dips and valleys, similarly the cerebral cortex is very convoluted and has its bumps and grooves, just like a mountainous region. However, climbing through that mountainous region, one night he came across a cottage. Inside the cottage was a family, which the monster spied upon through the window and was able to get a great amount of detail now of his visual perception. This indicates that the occipital lobe, which contains the visual cortex, must be functioning in the monster for him to be able to see information visually in great detail. I've given this area the nickname the optical occipital lobe due to its uh, function in sight. The monster also heard an elderly man playing music inside the cottage. The monster is able to compare these sounds with the ones of birds singing that he'd heard in the forest, thus showing a large degree of auditory perceptual recognition. This indicates that the temporal lobe inside the monster's forebrain must be functioning since the temporal lobe is involved in perceiving sounds. And I've given this area the nickname the tuneful temporal lobe since it's involved in processing sounds for music as well as it's involved in processing sounds for comprehending language as well, which the monster also did listening to people's conversations. He slowly started to be able to recognize the sounds of language. The next day, the monster went down to the water, and while bending over in front of the water, he saw his reflection for the first time and became aware of his true nature of being a monster. He suddenly achieved an insight into why people were afraid of him due to his monstrous appearance, and he concocted a plan for how to get around this, namely by putting on a disguise. Then he thought that people, such as the people in the cottage, would then be able to come to love him and not see him just as a monster. This indicates that his prefrontal cortex and his frontal lobe must be functioning, since the prefrontal cortex is involved in higher order thinking as well as long-term planning. And then with those plans sent to regions posterior in the frontal lobe, such as the motor cortex, that are involved in actually executing those plans. So I've given these regions the nickname the planning prefrontal cortex, and the forward-moving frontal lobe. However, when the monster went to the cottage in disguise, instead of being welcomed, he was attacked. Since the monster could tell which parts of his body had been hit, this indicates that his parietal lobe is working, since it contains a map of all the different parts of your body and receives somatosensory input from those parts. I've given this area the nickname the parts parietal lobe. Having been rejected by people too many times, the monster swears revenge upon humanity, and especially upon the man who created him, Victor Frankenstein. Yeah. Now that the story is over, try testing yourself to see how many of the names and functions of brain structures you can recall by imagining the story again in your head. Uh -huh.